In my past life as Matthew Franklin Whittier, I published almost all my work anonymously. Maybe I signed my real name, I don't know, 10 times or less, I think it is. And the other, I've got over 2,700 of Matthew's works, and all of those were published either with no signature or most of them had a pseudonym. There were a few pseudonyms that Matthew used uh, regularly or brought back. Some of them he would use just for one series, and some of them were one-offs. And I don't know, I haven't even counted them, but there's dozens, if not hundreds, ultimately. So uh, an awful lot of that material was mistakenly attributed to other authors. Sometimes, apparently, Matthew actually allowed the person to do that. And um, sometimes it was just a mistake by scholars. Sometimes it developed by rumor because his work was exceptionally good and people had to know who did this. And eventually they would settle on somebody either at the time or, you know, century, you know, century or so later. So um, there's an awful lot of Matthew's work floating around out there that people think was actually written by somebody else. If you put it all together, you get quite a substantial legacy, both in terms of size and quality. And that's what I want to demonstrate here. A few of Matthew's plagiarists became famous, and, that, and the reason it's more than just one or two is because his work was so exceptionally good. And his wife and soulmate, first wife and soulmate, Abby Poyan, was also a child prodigy, and she was also excellent, and her work was also plagiarized by at least three people that I know of, so I'm going to include her in this. What I'm going to do is kind of give a tour, and as much as possible, I'll show you the physical volumes that I have in my archives of, uh, of Matthew's work and a little bit of Abby's work and tell you who it was attributed to. And the point of all this is, I think, that when I claim, for example, something hugely famous like A Christmas Carol for Matthew and Abby's pen, I say that they were the original collaborators. And when I say that Matthew wrote The Raven and Annabelle Lee and things like that, people just assume that I'm saying these things for self-aggrandizement. You know, it's an obvious answer, an obvious interpretation. But that's just a, a scratching the surface of this. It's just the tip of the iceberg of Matthew's total legacy. I happen to mention these famous ones because I want to get people's attention. And I've tried it the other way. I've tried submitting uh, articles, papers to journals and saying, you know, oh, look, Matthew was the author of this obscure thing, you know, that hardly anybody's ever heard of. And they're not interested. See, that's boring to them. They don't want to hear about some obscure author. On the other hand, if I say Matthew was the author of The Raven, then of course they ridicule that. So I'm kind of stuck between the devil and the deep on this. So I thought what I do for anybody who happens to be watching this is to just, you know, demonstrate the, the, the vast bulk of this thing, you know, how many of Matthew's pieces are out there uh, attributed to other authors by either by popular consensus or by, you know, when one scholar, let's say that there's one obscure body of work and a scholar gets hold of it and he says, oh, I think it was such and such a person. And because nobody else is interested, he's now the expert and everybody quotes him. Even though he's just given an opinion off the top of his head on very scant evidence, that now is in black and white and that's now official history. See, that's how this thing works. Or maybe there might be two guys that don't like each other and they fight back and forth in the journals and nobody else cares. And, you know, so that becomes historical fact. And my research is much deeper than what these guys typically do, even though I don't have a degree in this area, literary history. So we're going to start here. I've got a pretty long list. And because it's so long, and I don't like to make these videos too terribly long, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with them. I just want to give a kind of an overview and a sense of the size of this thing. And I'm also going to tell you when I'm certain about these attributions and when I'm not 100% certain. Uh, I wouldn't be presenting them if I wasn't pretty darn sure, see? So that's, you know, the ones that are wild speculations I'm not even going to mention. So if I mention it at all, and I've gone to the trouble of spending some money on an antiquarian volume, I'm pretty darn sure. So, you know, either I'm absolutely certain or I'm like 99% sure, or in some cases I'm not. You know, it's tough to clinch. And what I base this on is 
evidence, and there's smoking guns very often, but it's also kind of the totality, you know? I have, not only did I write these things in the past and I have an intuitive sense of them, but I've read so many of Matthew's works that I really know his style inside and out now. I really know when I get hold of something, basically, if it, if it fools me, it's because it's a blatant intentional imitation. Those are the only ones that fool me anymore. Um, and those I can figure out pretty quickly because if I, if I have like five pieces that I think might be Matthew under a certain pseudonym, but it's actually an imitation, typically in one of those five, I will run across something about cruelty to animals where the author has a cruel attitude toward animals, you know, or children or uh, slavery, see, somebody's pro-slavery. Any of those things are contraindications that immediately cuts Matthew out unless they adulterated one of Matthew's pieces, which happened on a few occasions. But basically, I can tell the imitators because their spirituality is not as evolved as Matthew's. So anyway, we're going to get started. The first one, we're going to start in, we're going to go in chronological order, roughly. There's a fellow, a Scottish fellow, um, named Robert McNish. And in 1826, he published a series of stories under a pseudonym by a modern Pythagorean. And uh, these were in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine. And uh, there's three of them that I think were Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. I mean, I'm sure of it, basically, although this is one I can't absolutely clinch, okay? So one of them that appeared in the May 1826 edition is the Metempsychosis, so it's about reincarnation. Matthew was skeptical at this time, but Abby was trying to teach him these things, so that's how it came up. Then there's one called The Man with the Nose on August 1826 edition. Matthew had a long nose. Many occasions he wrote about long noses or disparaged his own long nose, see? So that's what this is about. That's Robert McNish had no reason to write that. Matthew Franklin Whittier had a deep reason to write it. And this is one of the ways that you can tell when something's been plagiarized because the plagiarist has no real context in his life. It doesn't mean anything to him. It doesn't come out of any context in his life. Whereas for Matthew, it comes out of a deep context. So Matthew was embarrassed about his long nose. He wrote about that on many occasions. This story is about a perfectly normal guy, a nice guy with a long nose, whom everybody is horrified by, see? And that's what would be typical of something Matthew would write this early because 1826, August of 1826, we're talking um, 14 years old. Matthew is 14, if I did my math right. Um, and then the third one is called The Barber of Gottingen, and that's in the October edition. So here they are. This is 1826 Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine. These are the, the two volumes for that whole year that these pieces appear in. And they're obviously in beautiful condition, so, you know, I, I like to show off my collection. Now, uh, the next one is actually a little bit, maybe a little bit earlier when it first appeared, but this is the Joe Strickland series. Joe Strickland was a, a boy, a country boy, supposedly from Vermont, who had run away to New York City and was writing letters home, see? And apparently he... he just happened to find this um, lottery shop and he was fascinated by what looked like a perpetual motion machine and stood for two hours watching it in the front window and then he started uh, buying lottery tickets and he would win them like crazy anytime he wanted money he would just you know play the lottery and he would win see well that was attributed to the lottery shop owner named george w arnold by like one scholar i think who was wrong uh, and the reason he attributed it to George W. Arnold is that an editor thought that's what it was. An editor thought it was what they call a puff or an advertisement written by the lottery shop owner. It was not. It, and here we have our deep context because Matthew had literally run away from home at age 12. He had literally gone to New York City. He was fascinated by, <clears throat> by technology. And... Uh, he apparently stood outside the window and watched this perpetual motion machine. But see, his parents were Quakers, and they were horrified by New York City, and they were horrified by the possibility, all the 
the sin of the city that he could get caught up in, and they warned him, and they warned him against gambling, and they warned him against the lottery. So he was teasing them, you know, that here he was in New York City, and he was winning the lottery, you know, hand over fist. So that was, that, and, and Matthew was literally a runaway, and the character was a runaway, see? So there's all this deep context from Matthew being the author. This is the very beginning of the style of using Yankee dialect in American humor. This was Matthew who launched that style as a boy of 12, okay? This gives you an idea of who we're dealing with. Now, it so happens that I do have a couple physical copies of that, and they're in the 1830 Philadelphia album. So I can't open all of these you know, and show you where they are inside, and I don't have the time to photograph examples of them. I'm tempted, but it would take forever, you know. So basically, I'll just show you the physical volumes. That's the 1830 Philadelphia album, in which there are a couple Joe Strickland pieces. It went on for some years. I'm going to go get some water here real quick, because I didn't do that. Now, um, in the 1831 New England Magazine, uh, the editor was Joseph T. Buckingham, and this, I believe, this is in Boston, and Matthew ran away to Boston and then to New York City, and I think he went back and forth between the two. Uh, I think that the editor, Joseph T. Buckingham, took Matthew under his wing and mentored him, but... Uh, Joseph's son, Edwin, who was a couple years older, was jealous. This is what I've extrapolated, not only from my own feelings, but quite a bit of evidence, and uh, became his enemy, actually. And Edwin Buckingham became the editor of the New England Galaxy while his father ran The Courier, which was a daily newspaper in Boston. His father owned both of them. So uh, anyway, Matthew started out as a boy of 12 in 1825, writing for the New England Galaxy, which was a major Boston literary newspaper. Unlike a lot of famous writers, he didn't start, like his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier, he didn't start in the local paper. He started in this huge Boston prestigious newspaper. Uh, then uh, the two of them, the father and son, Joseph and Edwin Buckingham, started the New England Magazine in 1831. And the very first piece, if I'm not mistaken, in here was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, even though his father, see, Edwin died like a couple years after this or a year or two after this magazine was started. And his father was of the impression that his son had written it. And I think that Matthew, who really loved Joseph Buckingham as a father figure, was not, um, was not prepared to disabuse him of the notion. Now, I'm mistaken because this very first one is actually signed with Matthew's middle initial F, which he used occasionally. We'll get back to F a little bit. This is called On the Consideration Due to the Mechanical Arts. It's the very first piece in the New England Magazine, the July 1831 edition. That's Matthew signing with his middle initial F. But there's others in here that I'm absolutely, at least one, that I'm absolutely certain was also Matthew's, that Joseph Buckingham thought was Edwin's. The backstory to all of this is that Edwin, I think, was spoiled. And uh, he went to sea. You know, that's what happened when a boy is really spoiled and, you know, he, he goes off to sea and kind of, you know, learns how to be a man or whatever. And he died at sea. So um, his father carried on, I think, for a little while with this magazine. But Matthew didn't have the heart to tell him that, no, that actually wasn't Edwin after all, you know. So I think it was left that way. There's uh, several of Matthew's pieces in that magazine. And they're, they're, there's different pseudonyms. That's one of the places where he started using a star or a single asterisk. That signature is in the New England magazine. He signed F for this one, and there's some other signatures, like I think XYZ and things like that. Matthew was being clever, you know, partly. He, it was, it was uh, a convention of the times, and he thought it was clever to use these different pseudonyms. Unfortunately, it made it very tough for me to, and posterity to sort it out. Now, the next one we have is Asa Green. Asa Green was an editor, first of the Berkshire American in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 
And then in New York City, starting in very late 1829, he launched the Constellation. And then he, later on in 1835, I think it was, he started the New York Transcript. So we have the New York Constellation and then the New York Transcript. Matthew wrote for all three of these papers. He edited the Constellation under Asa Green from 1830 to 1832. In 1832, there was a cholera, ep cholera epidemic and Matthew left New York City for a while at that point. Then he wrote five novels. All five of those novels are mistakenly attributed to Asa Green, as well as all the humorous writing in the Constellation. It's assumed that Asa Green was a humorist. He was no such thing, I think. He was a bookstore owner, and he also owned a newspaper. And my intuitive past life memory is that he was very happy to let Matthew run that newspaper because he was busy running his bookstore. So it, basically, he was the editor in name, I think for a good bit of that paper's run. And all the, all the original, all the humorous work, all of the editorials, everything was Matthew Franklin Whittier in the Constellation. So they have it all wrong, but in particular, the books. And the books, one of them will run you five or $6,000 right now, the one that he wrote about, uh, about Wall Street, see? <laughs> because it's the first time that anybody ever wrote about the workings of Wall Street in New York City. So stockbrokers apparently want that for their collection and they bid it way up into the thousands, see? So um, I do have, I don't have a physical copy of that. I can't drop five or $6,000 on a single book. I have a very nice reprint of that one, but I have the other ones, several of the other ones. And here we have um, Travels in America and the uh, Life and Adventures of Dr. Dodamus Duckworth. So those are some of the novels. There's also one, mine is not a first edition. It's very important because it's probably Matthew's first uh, novel for social causes. This is called The Debtor's Prison. Uh, the subtitle is A Tale of a Revolutionary Soldier. Mine is 1835, but this was actually first published in 1834. And one reason this is important is that we will get to other novels like this, including A Christmas Carol, see, because Matthew wrote uh, impassioned uh, editorials about debtor's prison even earlier in 1832 for the Constellation, and then he came out with this book about the debtor's prison in 1834. This was before Charles Dickens was writing about social causes, see. So when I say that Matthew was the original co-author of A Christmas Carol, Matthew was writing about the things that we associate with Charles Dickens before Dickens was, see? And Dickens could have read these things, so he could have been influenced by them. We can't say he was, but we can't say he wasn't. Now that's Asa Green. Now when Matthew started writing for Asa Green's third newspaper in New York, the Transcript, and I'm going to get a copy of that out. Here we go. Here are my, I think I have five copies of the New York transcript. I'm, I'm using my cell phone for this and I don't always know where to look. So, I, so if, I, if I look away sometimes it's because I forget or exactly where the lens is. This is the New York transcript. Matthew wrote what they call the police office. I think it's what they would call arraignment hearings today where somebody's arrested and they're brought in and there's an initial hearing to decide, you know, what to do with them and whether to have a trial and so forth. So uh, Matthew would report on that apparently very early in the morning. He also was pursuing a mercantile career at the same time, which uh, Joseph T. Buckingham said in his memoirs later on when he talked about Matthew and called him Moses Whitney instead of Matthew Whittier. Um, but believe it or not, somebody has decided, some scholar has decided who wrote those, and it's wrong. So there was a guy named William H. Attry, I believe he was a typesetter from England. He didn't have any writing experience. And what would happen is that Matthew would get the lowest job on a newspaper or a magazine, and then he would, he would excel in it. He would turn it into full-blown literature, see, uh, even though it was the lowest uh, status job on the paper. He did that with these 
reports, these police office reports, they're incredible. You know, they're, there's black humor, basically. It was like you could laugh or cry, and Matthew's attitude about life was you might as well laugh as cry. So, I mean, it's all black humor, but it's, and they didn't hesitate to give people's real names, apparently, back then. Um, so some people take umbrage at it, you know, but it's, it's meant as teaching stories. He's, tr he's, he's trying to teach morality to New York City through this black humor, if you really understand who's writing it, because this is a, he's a maverick Quaker, but Matthew's still a Quaker at this point. So it's a Quaker in New York City using, who has studied the satirists of, of England the last couple centuries very carefully, and he's using that satire to teach morality to New York City as a Quaker from a small town. <laughs> so you have to, again, you got to understand the backstory and the context, which I do, and, and the people that ridicule my work don't, okay? They don't have any of this context. So anyway, that, that whole body of work has been casually attributed to this William H. Atchery. He was a reporter for that paper. He was doing, I think, kind of bread and butter type reports. But Matthew was the one doing the humor and the, and the really creative original work. When I say original and creative, there's one where he just got bored and he decided to write it stream of consciousness, almost like a poem. I think it rhymes, if I remember correctly, but it's all stream of consciousness back when hardly anybody was writing stream of consciousness. And they printed it that way. I mean, there's no real information you could get out of it, you know, but it's, it's, it's almost like a poem. And they printed it. Now... Uh, we move forward to a book, or a, a, not a book, a publication from Boston called The Essayist. It's a young man's magazine, and uh, I have to pull that out kind of carefully here. This is The Essayist. I bought it years ago for $500 on Amazon. Um, I felt very strongly, that's a lot of money for me. I felt very strongly, Abby said, this is one of the cases where Abby really prompted me inwardly, and it was clearly not my subconscious mind. It was from her. She said, buy it. Never mind the price. Buy it. Well, I didn't know what was in it. Turns out it's got a whole bunch of Abby's poetry in it, <laughs> you know, some of which was later claimed by Albert Pike, some of which was claimed by the editor, George W. Light, and, and later published by Light as his own years later. Um, and it's got some of Matthew's work in it, signing as Franklin Jr. This ran from 1831 to 1833. George W. Light, later on, did publish a lot of those poems. It's called Keep Cool, Go Ahead, and a few other poems. Well, Keep Cool, I can see, see how thin it is. There's not, not much to it. Keep Cool was written in imitation. Um by George W. Light, I think. But uh, Keep It Work was written by Matthew. Uh, I think that uh, he was imitating it. There's one that he now calls Heart Union, which used to be called Marriage when it was in the essayist. You can see how he's moderated, modified rather these things. Um, there's one called Sunrise Song, which was clearly Abby's when she'd first fallen in love with Matthew and she was 14 before he new to reciprocate, and she was too young, she fell in love with him at age 14. We'll see why that's important a little later, but that she wrote that. Uh, here's one, Inward Life, which was written by Matthew. It's very somber. It's in his typical meter, um, and so on. Still Small Voice, that's one that George W. Light had, had uh, resurrected from the essayist, and that was Abby's, not his, and so on. So uh, that's we, that, but all that does basically is absolutely prove that uh, George W. Light was a plagiarist. <laughs> okay. Um, now, let's see. We've taken care of him. Now we come to Albert Pike. You may know of Albert Pike. I won't go through his history. Look him up. Um, he was a sociopath. There's a few of Matthew's plagiarists that I will really say. And remember that I have a master's in counseling. And uh, you can determine that kind of character disorder from a historical record because it has certain signatures. You know, it's fairly clear when somebody was a sociopath or a psychopath. Well, Pike was one of these. 
which means this person has no functioning conscience whatsoever, which means they can tell the most outrageous lie, they can do the most outrageous things, and it doesn't bother them. They still sleep fine, they don't, you know, they probably don't register in polygraph tests, you know, nothing, because it doesn't bother them at all. They don't have a, if they have a conscience somewhere, it's, it's not working, okay, it's shut down that particular piece of hardware or software is not running, see? So Albert Pike taught a class in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he grew up in 1830. From all the evidence I could put together, Abby Poyan, at age 13 and 14, was in that class. Her poetry was so incredible, she didn't need to be there. She could have taught the class at that point. She was a prodigy. I think she was there because her parents gave her an ultimatum, either we send you to a finishing school or you find some, you know, occupation that you want to pursue. And if you want to be a teacher, you have to take classes. That's what I'm guessing. But at any rate, she was in there and she really didn't need to be taught poetry. And she was writing poetry way better than Albert Pike ever could have dreamed of writing. And he, because they had the same last initials, he would publish it and, and pretend it was his. And I think his backup plan was if anybody caught him, he would just use the alibi that he was publishing it for Abby. And he never got caught, so he claimed the whole lot. Everything signed AP, he claimed. It so happens that Matthew published quite a few of her short stories and a couple of her poems in the Boston Weekly Museum in 1849-1850 with the same initials, AP. Okay, so it's, it wasn't Albert Pike, except that he turned her class assignments, he had told her, write, or told the whole class to write hymns to the Roman gods, see? So she had written several of them, and he maybe added a couple stanzas to one or two and wrote two or three of his own and, and made of it a series and claimed the whole series. Well, it wasn't his, okay? Uh, Anyway, I always call him the ass. I'm always careful to be sure somewhere in any presentation or any blog entry or anything I write where I mention Albert Pike, I make sure to call him the ass. So I have fulfilled my obligation. Um, so we have copies of that also. Here we have American Monthly Magazine, also called on the back, it says Willis's Magazine. This is 1830. It has several of... Uh, Abby's AP signed poems, which Albert Pike claimed, and the editor took them to be Albert Pike's at the time. Um, there's also a magnificent poem of hers in the April 1831, which I only have a reprint of. And then in, uh, I believe it was 1836, Albert Pike resubmitted the, uh, a whole bulk of Hymns to the Gods to uh, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, and not telling them that he had published them in 1830 in the American Monthly Magazine, and they took it as a fresh submission and gushed over it and so on. And his, his letter to the editor is reproduced in there, and it's very clear that he didn't tell them that he had previously published these. He made it sound like they were just in his drawer, and his friends in Boston just kept urging him to send them in for publication, and he knew there weren't any great shakes, but you know, total phony. Uh, let's see what else we got here. That's Albert Pike. Now, there's another famous fellow, a moderately famous fellow, named Edward Everett Hale, who was, later he became a, a minister, and I think he was supposed to be an abolitionist, but he was a, a real child prodigy who attended Harvard at age 12, I think. So when he was 13, he apparently stole two of Matthew Franklin Whittier's poems and published them as his own under a pseudonym that was the reverse of his reverse of his name, Elah. So he took Hale and reversed it to Elah. And the reason I know that is that um, is that when I bought these originals of Harvardiana, that's the 1836. Uh, student publication of Harvard, somebody had penciled in the actual last names of the uh, writers next to their pseudonym and next to Elah, they put Hale. So it's got to be Everett, Everett Hale. But anyway, there's two poems in here. One of them is to Abby. It's called To Adela. Adela is one of the names that Matthew would use in uh, 
literature to refer to Abby, the other one being Juliana or Julia. This was Adeline or Adela, and uh, it's a beautiful, very deeply personal love poem to Abby, basically telling her she'd probably turned 16. They'd already been courting in a chaste fashion for some months, and he was telling her, can we not now explain can we not now be intimate, basically? And we don't know what level of intimacy he meant or that ended up. I have my own ideas about that. But basically, that's what this poem is about. You know, can we not now express our love physically? Uh, it's, it's a beautiful, deep uh, love poem. Edward Ever Hale, at age 13, when he supposedly uh, wrote that or published it, <clears throat> was not that kind of person. First of all, he wrote this love poetry that was kind of like he imagined it, that he had a harem. You know, if you can imagine a king with a harem and he, he likes, he loves the lips of this one and the eyes of that one and so forth and so on. That's the kind of poetry that Edward Everett Hale at age 13 was actually writing. And it's clear that the, the girls he was referring to probably looked at him as like a little brother, okay? And they indulged him in his sexual fantasies, see? But they didn't actually do anything with him. This poem is totally different, and this is where you get into context again. The other thing about that is that the other poem is a humorous poem about cats caterwauling at midnight. It's right down the line Matthew's style. There's two other examples of Matthew writing on that topic. So while I can't clinch this one, I'm pretty darn sure by style and context. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Find my water glass. We're like a quarter of the way or less through this list. Even if you don't watch all of this video, I want you to understand what we're dealing with. It's not just one or two famous people that I've latched onto and claimed for Matthew. Um, Edwin H. Chapin. Reverend Edwin H. Chapin was a fine fellow. Um, Matthew would never accuse him of plagiarism. I won't accuse him of plagiarism. However, there is a poem, and it's a, it's a strange, circuitous route as to how I got to this. And uh, here we have an album. An album was like you sign your friend's yearbook in high school. Uh, girls especially would have an album. They would get their friends to write a poem in the album. Or, uh, or a message or something, you know, like somebody would sign your yearbook or your cast or something. Except these were, I mean, they weren't always original. Where they weren't original, typically somebody would, you know, would attribute it, would say who had written the poem. Or if it was original, you know, they would just sign their name. There's a poem or lines from a poem called The Beautiful in here with Matthew's name and no attribution. So Matthew took maybe the last four stanzas or something from The Beautiful and wrote them in here. And it's kind of ambiguous the way he did it, but he didn't attribute it. And then he says, from your classmate, something, something, and M.F. Whittier, see? Well, so I, I felt like, well, that I felt like that was Matthew's poem, but I looked it up and it's attributed to this Edwin Chapin, Reverend Chapin. And it shows up in the 1842 edition of an annual called, here it is, The Rose of Sharon. The Rose of Sharon, a religious souvenir, and this is for 1842, edited by Miss Sarah C. Edgerton. And this in, it actually was printed in Boston. Um, and it gave uh, Miss Edgerton the opportunity to publish her own poems, partly, I think. But here in the very, very, very back of this, the last poem is the beautiful, the same poem that Matthew took some lines from for the album and didn't attribute. Now, Matthew was very careful about attribution. Had he not written it, had it actually been Edwin Chapin's poem, he would have said so. I am 100% certain of that. Well, anyway, um, this is attributed to Edwin H. Chapin. It cannot be his. I looked at some of his other work. Far as I can tell, what he's known for are hymns. He collaborated on a bunch of hymns with someone else. But this poem is mystical. And when I say mystical, I mean it incorporates the mystical concepts of as above, so below, and what you'd see in Hermeticism and so on, which is what Abby taught him, see? 
And he would have written this, I think, uh, when Abby was still alive, when they lived here in Portland, where I am now. There's a poem in precisely the same meter that I believe was signed F with Matthew's middle initial, just like the other one I mentioned, um, in the Portland transcript when they lived here and he and Abby both were submitting to the Portland transcript in precisely the same style and meter. Uh, that had to do with having lost their son like the year before in 1838. This was published in 1839. I don't have that right in front of me. I don't think I have a physical copy of that. but. I'm saying that Matthew wrote that. Now, how Edwin Chapin's name got on it, I have no idea. The best scenario I can come up with is that he, he apparently was in a convention in Portland in 1839, if I'm not mistaken, when Matthew and Abby lived here. They would have sought him out. Uh, he was a Southerner, but he moved to Boston and became an abolitionist, if I'm not mistaken. They would have sought him out, and they would have shared some of their poetry with him, both of them. And he would have shared that with other people, not, and they would always insist on anonymity, Matthew and Abby both. So he would have shared that. Chapin would have shared that poetry with other people and there's no name on it. So he, they assumed that he had written it. So then it goes down the line and somebody said, you know, that each person would be told, oh, I got this from Edwin Chapin. See, and they'd assume after the third or fourth person that he'd written it. And then they submitted it for him to the Rose of Sharon with his name on it. That's my guess. I don't think Edwin Chapin deliberately plagiarized Matthew and Abby because in the previous edition, there's one there's a poem with his name on it that I think was written by Abby. It's in her style, see? It's about Mary and Martha. It's typical of what Abby would have written. So I think they would share their poetry and other people would end up with the, with the um, attribution. So that's kind of an interesting case. Now we come to Charles Dickens. Now who is this guy, Charles Dickens, see? He's just one of the people who either plagiarized Matthew and Abby or ended up with the credit for their work. Just one of many, see? It just so happens he was famous and got more famous or famouser, if there's such a word, by publishing A Christmas Carol, because his career was kind of flagging. You know, Martin Chuzzlewit wasn't all that well received. He was uh, spending a uh, living beyond his means. He was in financial trouble. So there's a long, long, long story as to how he ended up with A Christmas Carol. But the best I can do on my finances, I bought an 1845 edition of A Christmas Carol. And even that, at $300, it's had certain pages that's been rebound and there's certain pages that have been uh, added, you know, reproduced. So the, the most of the illustrations and the title page are not original in this volume, but the rest of the text is original. So that's as close as I could get. It's 1845. It's like the 12th or 13th edition, something like that. And if you look it up, um, that's when it was published. I've gone into the uh, background for that a million times. Matthew and Abby together had a very, very deep context and a history for having written that. Uh, Charles Dickens had nothing. He dashed it off in six weeks, supposedly sheer imagination. And his lie about how he wrote it is impossible. Walking the black streets of London many a night for six weeks is, is nonsense. It's just theatrical nonsense. You know, alternately laughing and weeping, you know, while he was walking the black streets of London. He's an actor. Can't people understand that this guy is primarily an actor and he's a bullshitter and that that couldn't possibly be true? <laughs> Maybe somebody somewhere has questioned it. I haven't seen anybody question it. I mean, I can't read everything that's ever been written on, on A Christmas Carol, you know. It would take me two or three lifetimes to do that. Then we come to another obscure person named Elizabeth Barrett Browning. <laughs> she also, see, what happened was, this is all around 1842. So, Abby died in March, March 27 of 1841. Matthew was, of course, devastated, but by 1842, he was writing tributes to her. And he, for some reason, I, maybe after he handed uh, Dickens their joint manuscript of A Christmas Carol in Boston in January of 1842, when Dickens came to America, he got the idea of sending his work to these famous literati, these famous literary figures, both in America and abroad. 
And they, most of them, we don't know, but presumably people like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow would look them over and send them back and say, thank you very much, and, and I think this has merit, and so forth and so on. A couple of them were phonies. They were imposters, including Charles Dickens and including Elizabeth Barrett. The future Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a phony. She wasn't, you know, really the poet or the author that we imagined she was. And the same with Dickens, who stole a whole bunch of his works, especially if you include ideas. If you look into his history, you know, he, most of his stuff wasn't his idea or even his work. I don't think David Copperfield was his from the get-go, but I won't get into all that. But Elizabeth Barrett plagiarized five of Matthew's poems by My Lights and one of Abby's that Matthew had sent her. So apparently, at least one of these was sent before Abby died, before 1832. And that was a poem that she first published in 1840. It's in Findon's Tableau. It's a, a coffee table book in England. And uh, here it's called The Dream. And here is the illustration for The Dream. And then the poem immediately picks up. It's the first thing in the volume. Uh, here's the title page for Finden's Tableau. I have to be careful with these things. This is, this is archival plastic, but it's not the right kind of archival plastic. So it's a little awkward because I can't afford it that big. That's the dream in Finden's Tableau. When she published Poems, her major compilation in 1844, and then republished it in America under uh, a drama of exile and other poems in 1845, um, she changed the name to A Child Asleep. But I happen to have both of these. They're extremely fragile. This is cheap paper. It's not like rag paper like they use in America. It's, it's very brittle. You touch it and the piece breaks off. But this is, uh, I forget which volume, one or two. This is one of the volumes of poems, the one that was published in 1844 in England. And this is Drama of Exile and Other Poems. This is volume one, so this must be volume two. Um, this one has Lady Geraldine's Courtship. Elizabeth, that's one of Matthew's. That was a tribute poem to Abby. Lady Geraldine is supposed to be the daughter of an earl. Abby was literally the daughter of a marquis, which is one step higher. She, uh, and it was, she was from French heritage, not English. So Matthew changed up a few things. Abby was 15 when they were courting, when these things happened. You know, and of course, Matthew made Lady Geraldine a little older. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, Bertram, the main character in Lady Geraldine's courtship, was a, a, a poor poet, you know, and a, and a philosopher. Matthew was exactly the same. You know, their relationship was the same, basically. Uh, Matthew very often would, so much of his writing is, is in the form of letters, letters to the editor, letters to somebody else. His stories are couched inside letters. Matthew was really big on literature in correspondence. Lady Geraldine's Courtship is a poem within a letter to a friend. So, I mean, it's got, and there's, there's so many elements in it. It's got Matthew all over it. And Elizabeth Barrett's explanation to her mentor, Hugh Stuart Boyd, as to how she wrote this poem is clearly a lie and a very childish, amateurish lie, obvious. Why somebody hasn't picked up on this is utterly beyond me. Although I did find in writing to professors that Elizabeth Barrett Browning has kind of gone out of fashion among scholars, you know. But specifically why nobody has ever told me. Maybe they began to pick up on some of her BS, you know. And said, uh-oh, we need to leave this one alone because this lady didn't write this stuff, you know. And it's like a can of worms they don't want to open. I really have no idea. Anyway... The Cry of the Children, which is pretty famous. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier's poem. The uh, Wine of Cyprus, that's, that poem is one that Robert Browning, that caused Robert Browning to fall in love with Elizabeth Barrett and to marry her. He fell in love with Elizabeth Barrett on the basis of a poem written by an American man. <laughs> and he didn't know it. He never knew it. I mean, a poor guy. I feel so bad for him. I mean, I've been fooled at times, you know. Boy, was he fooled. Um, now, there's a fellow in Britain 
we're talking around 1844, named, his name was Beck. That's as far as I can trace it. But he used the pseudonym Pierre's, P-I-E-R-S, Shafton. And uh, he apparently plagiarized one of Matthew's stories called A Night with the Industrious Fleas. Uh, it's in the Illuminated Magazine, 1844, which I have. Here it is, 1844, Illuminated Magazine. I won't open this and try to show you because it's a little tough on the spine with these big ones. Uh, it's in the back. Unfortunately, those pages happen to be yellowed. I don't know why certain pages would be yellowed and some not. But uh, at any rate, I have an original of that. Uh, it's a long story as to how I found it. It shows up in another American book called The Harp of a Thousand Strings, and I traced it back from there. It's... I can't absolutely 100% say that it's Matthew Franklin Whittier's work, but I looked very deeply into Pierre Shafton as far as I could. There's one book that he published as a compilation, and the same author couldn't have written all of the pieces in his compilation. They're all over the map on a number of different parameters. He was the kind of plagiarist who would just borrow willy-nilly from a whole bunch of people, throw them together on some pretext, and claim the lot. See, he was that kind of plagiarist, and there were several like that. Uh, so we don't know who wrote A Night with the Industrious Fleas. I can pretty much say with certainty it was not Pierre Shafton or Mr. Beck. Um, I'm saying it was Matthew Franklin Whittier. It's got his style all over it, and that's as far as I can take that. Uh, let's see. We've, we've got a long way to go on this. Margaret Fuller. Margaret Fuller, I don't have a physical copy of this. It's way too much money. I've got reprints. She was the editor of the Transcendentalist magazine, The Dial, 1840, 1841. Uh, some of her stuff is in there unsigned, which is typical. That would be the protocol for an editor, not to sign. But there's several reviews in there, and the, uh, the very first piece in the very first edition after Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, introduction is a piece called on, I think it's called On Critics or something like that. It's about critics. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier. It's signed F. And then all the reviews for the rest of that journal signed F. That's Matthew signing F, just like we've seen him signing F before, see? So that's, that's Matthew Franklin Whittier signing F for Franklin. That's not Margaret Fuller. And the way I found out is that in the New York Tribune, now we're talking from the fall of 1844 until mid to late, mid to the fall of um, 1846, a couple of years, Matthew was using his star signature. Now he had started using that star signature in Joseph T. Buckingham's daily newspaper, The Courier. That's the first place I found it in 1829. Okay, and then he kept right on using it. Uh, Margaret Fuller died tragically in 1850 in a, a ship accident, and Matthew kept right on using it uh, until 1873 is the last example of Matthew using the star that I found. So it was Matthew signing as the star in the Tribune. This is a weekly edition. I have one daily and a whole bunch of weeklies. Uh, I won't go through that any further, just to show you that I have a whole bunch of copies of that. Um, that's another outrage. That developed by rumor. I mean, she didn't start out publicly saying, I wrote as the star. She did say that privately to one friend upon being asked early on, but it developed as a rumor. She didn't back off of the rumor, and everybody assumed that she was acquiescing, that she was saying she was the star. When she left New York to be the foreign correspondent for the paper, about the same time Matthew left, around uh, July of 1846, she wrote from Europe and kept using that signature. But Matthew also kept right on using that signature in other newspapers. The first thing he did was to go to New Orleans. He wrote for the Daily Delta in New Orleans. And again, he got another job in the police office, just like he had done in the New York Transcript. He made of that, even more so, he made of that real literature but he signed that first year, the first summer that he worked in New Orleans, F. Okay. That was in 1846. Then he went back in 47, and none of that is signed, and so on. Um, let's see. We're going to move right along here. Edgar Allan Poe. We don't need to belabor Edgar Allan Poe too much. 
I have two copies of The Raven. I won't tell you how much they cost. This is just the February 1845 edition. Um, and this is the entire six months, the first six months of American Review. It includes The Raven, and it also includes uh, Some Words with a Mummy, which Matthew also wrote. Here is The Raven. As it first appeared, signed blank Quarles. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier's pseudonym that stood, I think, for Abby Quarles. I think the blank and blank Quarles stood for Abby Quarles. It was a play on words because Abby was one heck of a debater, especially when you got her on uh, subjects of mysticism or religion, which the Raven has to do with life after death. When you try to argue with her on any of those topics, she could beat you hands down. So uh, because she loved the poetry of Francis Quarles, he made a double entendre out of it and called her uh, called her Abby Quarles. I think that was a fond nickname for her. And of course, he wanted to keep her name hidden. So uh, he, he signed the Raven blank Quarles in American Review. Uh, that was not the first time that he had submitted uh, a kind of a home, uh, homecoming um, piece to a journal because we saw that he did exactly the same thing for the New England Magazine. He submitted a piece as a present um, to them. I'm trying to think of the right term for uh, a, pr a present to somebody when they first get in a house, and I can't think of it. I'm blanking on that. But anyway, he, he gave them a present for the first edition of New England Magazine, and I think he did the same thing for American Review, and it didn't get into the first edition. It got into the second one. And he would do that anonymously. They wouldn't, the editor, even the editor, wouldn't know who it was that had sent it in. His work was so good, he would... In other words, he would get published as a first-time author over and over and over because he was that good. Now, I've written a great deal about that. We won't belabor it. Francis Duravage. This is so complicated, and uh, it's going to be a real nightmare to explain. But uh, I'll go through it again very, very, very briefly. Matthew apparently ghost wrote for this fellow, Francis Alexander Duravage, starting back in 1835, somewhere I've got it, I'm not sure exactly where it is, with a, a, a historical encyclopedia. And I can't prove that that's Matthew, but I'm saying a lot of it is. I know, for example, that Matthew loved Lord Byron's poetry. And when you get to the uh, entry for Byron, it's very long and very uh, lyrical, you know. A normal encyclopedia writer would not write like that about anybody. So, it, but it, it fits Matthew's style hand in glove. So I'm saying that that was Matthew's first work for Francis Duravage. Then he went on to write a series of novels. And uh, some of them, actually all of them, I think, I have here Edith Vernon, uh, Crime and Retribution, and let's see, that was 1845. I just have like, they're just little tiny novels. And then there's another one. And it so happens that in a, somebody took several things that they liked, uh, most of them from Brother Jonathan, but uh, that particular story is in here. So I have a physical copy of that as well. Here it is. This is this is the middle of Angela or Love and Guilt. So I have that in the physical volume. There's one I don't have except in a reprint called Mike Martin. That was Matthews. That was also 1845. So all of those were legitimate where Matthew apparently decided to let Francis Duravage sign his work and he was paid for it and he was ghostwriting for him. Not ghostwriting in the sense of somebody who can't write very well is telling his life story. Ghostwriting in the sense of, you know, I'll write this and you can put your name on it and you pay me. Then, apparently, with that personal background, in 1848, early in 1848, Francis Duravage, as I've extrapolated, must have approached Matthew with a friend who had the money, George Burnham. Now, uh, Duravage is another sociopath, in my estimation. Burnham may or may not have been, but he was definitely a crook, a white-collar criminal who had some money. And they apparently made the agreement, verbally, with Matthew that they could look through his portfolio 
and pick out a few pieces that they would like to publish under their own names. And Matthew, desperately needing money at that point for his second family, must have agreed. And uh, so what happened is that they presented him with a contract and he didn't read it or he didn't read the fine print. And that contract said that he had now signed over his entire portfolio of unpublished work going back to 1830 or so to these guys. And they immediately proceeded to publish it under their own names and under their pseudonyms, the olden and the youngen. So all the material you see in the flag of our union or Gleason's pictorial or the spirit of the times, I think it is, or several other newspapers that signed with those pseudonyms with George Burnham, uh, Francis Duravage, FAD, uh, or the olden and the young and that's all Matthew Franklin Whittier with maybe one or two exceptions. Okay, it's a huge, vast amount of work, some of which Matthew would not have wanted to publish in 1849, because some of it is very prejudiced, okay? And Matthew was more prejudiced back in like 1830. Or, I mean, he was kind of normally prejudiced for 1830, not viciously so, but he, he, he bought into the stereotypes. So he wrote with stereotypes in 1830 about black people as well as a number of other groups. And Duravage and Burnham published that stuff in 1850, 1851, 1852, when he never would have wanted to publish it himself at that time, which is one reason I know that it goes back that far. Uh, this is significant because, and I have this work physically, um, I have a very nice copy of The Three Brides, Love in a Cottage, and Other Tales. Here we are. The next to last story in here is called The New Year's Bells. And by my understanding of Matthew Franklin Whittier's work and his style and what he was writing in 1830 and 1831, 32, it's kind of science fiction-ish, humorous or, and or morality-based science fiction fantasy. And here it is. That is a, assuming it was written at the time that I believe it was written, which is well before 1843, this is a template for a Christmas carol. People laugh at that, that I say it's a template. This is a template. <laughs> it's not even a precursor. It's a template, okay? So, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. There it is. There's, uh, there's several compilations that they did. I've got also copies of Gleason's Pictorial that have Matthew's work stolen by Francis Duravage. That's a pretty big volume. I won't get that out just to pick it up in front of the camera. So that's Francis Duravage, but it's extremely important because of the New Year's bells, which he happily preserved for us unknowingly. Um, there's several dime novels that show up later on, reprinted uh, with Duravage's name on them, that have Matthew Franklin Whittier's authorship all over them. And what you can do is you can take Matthew's 1850 book, which is called the mistake of a lifetime, or the vicissitudes of the, of the land and the sea, or something like that. I can't remember the title. But this is one of several copies I've got of the mistake of a lifetime. And Matthew published that under the pseudonym Waldo Howard, a one-off pseudonym, um, in 1850. And if you look at these, like Edith Vernon, you know, and you look at the characters that are in there, and the style and so on. And then you look at The Mistake of a Lifetime, and then you look at these, which are probably probably written by Matthew very early. Okay, so here we have, this is in the Log Cabin Library. I forget when it's published, but it's, you know, late 1890s or something. This is called Hunted Down. And there are people that love to collect these things. You know, they didn't come cheap. Um, this is called The Phantom of the Sea, or The Red Cross and the Crescent. All these things have Francis Duravage's name on them. They are not. They were written by Matthew. This is called Dewberry's Revenge, with, Ma with Francis Duravage's name on them. They're all Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. Now, how did they get, how did Duravage get his hands on them? How did he get his name on them? Where were they originally printed? See, because I don't think they were originally printed as these dime novels. I don't have the answer to any of those questions. <laughs> you know, I just know Matthew's work when I see it, and if you compare that to The Mistake of a Lifetime, knowing that Matthew wrote that, you will see the same character names even, no less plot elements. Now, George Burnham, 
1855, used a very sneaky trick to try to associate his name with a book called The Rag Picker or Bound and Free. I have a copy of this book. It is not easy to get hold of, let me tell you. And uh, the only way I was able to get it is that it was under a misspelling, you know, listed in eight books under a misspelling, and collectors had missed it, and I managed to find it. So that's the only reason I've got it. Um, it's a long story as to how George Burnham tried to get his name associated with it. He failed. I can prove absolutely that, that it was not him, you know. Uh, but what he did was he had money. He bought a publisher in Boston, like a clearinghouse of printers, and Fetterhen and Company, and he put his name on it, Burnham, Fetterhen and Company. And he uh, started advertising this book for sale with his name on it as the author. And that got into the papers in Boston briefly, and then that was the last anybody ever heard of it, apparently. So it didn't work. But some historian got hold of that and put it in a little short biography. And then somebody else who's famous, I forget his name, but he's famous among librarians, got hold of that. And it became fact. Capital F, capital A, capital C, capital T. It became a, an academic fact that George Burnham, well, I was able to actually dispute that with WorldCat, OCLC. If you look up, uh, if you look up the rag picker or bound and free in WorldCat, you will find that I successfully got Matthew's name as kind of an also ran as a possible author. That was the best I could do. But that was the one, one example that I was actually able to influence the system in that one little way. And the reason I was able to do it is it's so obvious. George Burnham could not possibly have written it. Now, I've said this about, like, the Raven and A Christmas Carol. Those Poe and Dickens respectively could not possibly have written those works, but they're so famous, see, you can't budget. But this one nobody has ever heard of, and it's so obvious that George Burnham wasn't the author. He was a racist. This is a this is an anti-slavery novel, <laughs> and he it's a long story. This is also a, a temperance novel. And he was the last person that ever could have written a temperance novel, see? He got in trouble for stealing the state's liquor when he was put in charge of it, you know? So it's, it's absurd, right? It has, to be, it has to be completely obscured where nobody's offended. And it has to be so obvious that it's like painfully obvious before you can get the system to budge. Now we're way over. I'm going to continue and then try to wrap this up as quick as I can. We're like well over an hour now. Um, Asha Dodge was an entertainer. He couldn't even write his own songs. He had to run contests to get other people's songs. If he didn't steal them, he was called the Dodge. That was his nickname because he was, a, you know, whether he was a sociopath or not, I don't know, but he was certainly a tricky son of a gun, you know, like George Burnham. And uh, in the Boston Week Museum, which I think you can see here, there's two huge volumes, which I'm not going to pick up and show to the camera. That's the Boston Weekly Museum, 1850 and 1851. Um, in uh, late 1849, Matthew started writing as quails. He adopted that pseudonym, and it was a travelogue, but he also wrote a series. He broke off when he was uh, laid over in Boston. He was uh, apparently a, a traveling postal inspector. He was laid off in Boston, and he, instead of submitting the travelogue, he submitted a series of humorous sketches there exactly and precisely in the style of the pieces that uh, Duravage and Burnham had stolen from him. Okay? Now, uh, Ash and Dodge couldn't write. He had no experience as a writer, but Matthew apparently traveled with him when he would go to his gigs. He was like a rock star, you know, like a humorous rock star. And Matthew wrote for him. I think Matthew ghost wrote Ash and Dodge's routines. And there's one in particular that where Ash and Dodge is making faces, which he was good at, pretending to be seeing Niagara Falls and pretending to be different people seeing Niagara Falls for the first time. I, I got a very strong past life hit on that. That was my idea as Matthew. So Matthew was traveling with him. And one of the other contributors to the Boston Weekly Museum, seeing that the itinerary of Dodge and the itinerary of Quails matched up, at least for a certain period of time, got the bright idea that Dodge was actually Quails. That was published as a rumor. Then later on, the editor, Charles A.V. Putnam, started asserting it. And toward the end of the run of the paper, right before Ash and Dodge literally bought out 
the Weekly Museum, the editor was saying in black and white, flat out, that Dodge had been writing his quails. But I can prove, absolutely, that it was not him. And the way I can prove it is that when quails goes overseas, I've shown this before, when quails goes overseas, he goes to the World Peace Congress, which Dodge was a closet conservative. He would have had no interest in the World Peace Congress. Matthew was an anti-war uh, peace advocate, having been raised Quaker. Here, here we're in our context again. Matthew has, you know, a 10 fathoms deep context for being at the World Peace Congress. Also, Quayles says he's at the reporter's desk. Well, Matthew knew shorthand. He freelanced as a reporter. Ash and Dodge didn't know, didn't know shorthand so far as I know and had no credentials whatsoever to be invited to sit at the reporter's desk. So right there we've got him. It's impossible. But at the opening in Exeter Hall, the World's Peace Congress, 1851, I think it was July, um, they had an illustrator who illustrated the entire room. Okay, and I think David Brewster is giving the talk. David Brewster is rendered photorealistically, so you know it's actually him. The first, the closest third of the audience is likewise rendered photorealistically. So he, he drew their actual faces because he had lots of time and he had a loop, I would guess. Well, Matthew's at the reporter's desk. You can see him. You know, if you zoom in, you'll find Matthew Franklin Whittier, not Osh and Dodge, seated at the reporter's desk. And he's looking up at David Brewster because he doesn't, he's not required to take down the opening speech, see, as a reporter for the uh, Boston Weekly Museum in America. So he's the only one that's looking up at the speaker instead of writing. And you can tell it's him. He's even got, in, the, in this picture, he's got a loop of hair, wild loop of hair on the left side. Matthew Franklin Whittier's one known portrait from a few years later has the, exactly the same loop, see. So we know definitely, 100%, Matthew was writing as quails, not Osh and Dodge. <clears throat> now, there's implications to that too, but they're escaping me at the moment, so I'm going to move on. There's a, a poet named Robert Johnson in the Boston Weekly Museum. He plagiarized one of Matthew's poems. It was a kind of a grief poem. For Abby, not not for Abby. It was a grief poem written after one of their children died, and uh, I think it was the the same one that they had written a, um, a child asleep about. Their little boy Joseph, at eleven months, died at eleven months, and uh, the poem would have been about him. So uh, Robert Johnson stole the poem. Matthew must have shared it with him by way of mentoring him. He did pass through the city that Robert Johnson lived in. This poem is nowhere near like Robert Johnson's other poems, which are nowhere near as good as this one. So uh, all Robert Johnson did, was probably because it was a work in progress and didn't have a title, he gave it the ridiculous biblical title of Remember How Short My Time Is, Wherefore Hast Thou Made All Men in Vain, which has nothing to do with the poem. <laughs> you know, so that's an obvious one. Uh, there's more history to that I won't go into. Cornelius Matthews, you may have heard of Cornelius Matthews. He was kind of a, a slightly lesser author, but among the big ones back in the day. Um, there is a novel called Chanticleer, a Thanksgiving story of the Peabody family, which I happen to have two copies of. Here's one of them. This book... This book was published anonymously in 1850. There's no name on it. Uh, I immediately picked up on it because Matthew often used the word Chanticleer for a rooster, which is the French. Abby was French. Uh, Ma Matthew often liked to use the name Peabody as a family name. And uh, when I looked at the style, immediately I could see that this was a collaboration between Matthew and Abby. It was primarily... Abby's novel, it would have been written around 1833. Matthew was in Boston, but they could meet in Boston, I think. And uh, Matthew was at this time writing those five novels that got attributed to Asa Green, same period. So while he was working on those five novels, she was working on Chanticleer, and Matthew would collaborate with her. In 1856, it comes out with Cornelius Matthew's name on it, and that's what scholars believe. But it's nothing like Cornelius Matthews' style. This is a deeply spiritual person that wrote this, you know, and you can see it. 
uh, Cornelius Matthews was kind of a political liberal, but he wasn't spiritual at all. So it's a total mismatch. And what I don't understand is how scholars can take something that's just vaguely plausible and somebody decides that's the correct attribution. And once they put it in print, nobody ever argues it, really. I mean, at least with the, with the minor ones. They just accept it. And it just goes down in history and in all the libraries, you know, with this absurd, patently absurd, very weak attribution on it. You know, I, I don't understand it. These people are supposed to be experts, you know what I'm saying? And if you challenge them, even nicely, if you dare say anything that's different than the official status quo, they, they, won't, they won't answer. They're uh, patronizing. They'll, they'll send you back. If they send you anything at all, they'll send you like two lines of patronizing text and you'll never hear from them again. Nobody wants to rock the boat, basically. We've got a few more here. Benjamin Drew. Um, in the carpet bag, and I have a volume of the first year of the carpet bag. And, uh, well, since i got I got to take it out anyway... Here's uh, Gleason's pictorial, a, a lot of uh, Francis Duravage's ripped off pieces from Matthew Franklin Whittier are. So uh, there's that. But this, let's see, no, it's not that one. I live in a small place. Here is volume one, 1851-1852 of the carpet bag. These are unbelievably rare. Um, I got an extremely good deal on it, so much so that I feel guilty, but there's nothing I can do about it because I couldn't afford what it's uh, really worth. I bought this for, I think it was $325, a um, very bad copy of volume two with no cover on it and not, con not consistent uh, uh, editions is, is somebody's trying to sell it for like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars right now. No, thousand, twelve thousand, thirteen thousand dollars. They're trying to sell that for. You know, that's how rare this thing is. Well, anyway, in 1851 appeared a series of poems signed Trismegistus. Matthew had used that pseudonym as early as 1828. He used it again in uh, 1836. In Blackwoods, there's a Trismegistus piece by Matthew there in Blackwoods Edinburgh Magazine. And in 1835, he had used it at least once in the New York transcript. So Trismegistus was Matthew Franklin Whittier. But when uh, Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, the editor of The Carpet Bag, who was also Matthew's personal friend and collaborator, uh, when he wrote his memoirs many years later, he said that Trismegistus and everything that spun off from Trismegistus was written by a fellow named Benjamin Drew. Well, I got into Benjamin Drew's personal papers. It wasn't Drew, but he apparently claimed a couple of the poems. Matthew, again, had apparently shared a couple poems with this fellow, and he had put them in his diary as though they were his. And back in the 19th century, people would share their diaries with their family, so he must have done it to impress his wife or his kids or something. And then he must have showed that to to uh, Shillaber many years later because they were personal friends and Shillaber believed that Matthew had lied to him because he didn't really trust Matthew. He kind of looked askance at Matthew anyway. Uh, he's kind of a crazy guy. Uh, the crazy guy who had told him he'd originally written The Raven, which he didn't believe, see? I've got evidence of that. So uh, in the memoirs, Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber says that Benjamin Drew had written Trismegistus and all the spin-offs. Well, the spin-offs were the most popular characters in the whole paper. They were a takeoff on the military mentality, Ensign Jahil Stebbings, and a, a caricature of academia and academic philosophers named E. Goethe Digg. That was all Matthew Franklin Whittier. The, the context, again, is like five fathoms deep. There's no context at all. Matter of fact, it's contraindicated for Benjamin Drew. So uh, all of that was Matthew Franklin Whittier. And Matthew was a part owner of this paper. He invested. He was like a silent partner investing in this paper, the carpet bag. And uh, he was the by far the most prolific and original author. So what would happen is he would contribute as many as eight of the pieces for each weekly edition. I found one that has eight of Matthew's pieces in it under different pseudonyms. And then the other 
writers would imitate him to pad out the paper because Schillerber had decided he didn't want any advertising. But if you have a weekly eight-page paper, humorous paper, um, and you have to fill it every week, and you're not going to have any advertising, and he, he didn't want to pull from any other papers. He didn't want to cut and paste from other papers. The only way to do that is to have a core of extremely prolific authors. Well, nobody's that prolific except Matthew and a few other people. Um, so they would imitate Matthew, and Schillerber would let them imitate Matthew, okay? He, he wouldn't stop it. And then Matthew would protest in the other pieces that he wrote and so on, and there was a war going back and forth. Ultimately, I think that paper was torn apart between the conservatives and the liberals because Matthew was radical. The editor was mildly conservative. Some of the other... Uh, people involved in the paper were more conservative, conservative, and so on, and that tore the paper apart. That and the fact that they couldn't sustain a paper like that without advertising, and ultimately it folded. I think it folded because, for political reasons, they pushed Matthew out, and when they pushed Matthew out, the quality of the material went down, became kind of insipid. It wasn't as radical, but it was insipid, and they and the paper just folded because. Matthew had built up an audience of maybe 400 uh, very astute, you know, liberal people. And when Matthew was out and they were no longer seeing his work in there, they lost interest. And that, I think, is why the paper died. Not, be, not directly because the material was too radical, which was uh, Schillerber's take on it. Now, let's see. We get to Charles Farrar Brown. He's famous. He wrote a character named Artemis Ward, which was a blatant knockoff of Matthew's Ethan Spike. But he got his start in the carpet bag by ripping off and reworking one of Matthew's humorous pieces about a reenactment um, of the Battle of Yorktowns called Surrender of Cornwallis. And he snuck it into the paper when he was working as a printer's apprentice. That's the official story. But actually, he... Uh, ripped it off from something that Francis Duravage had ripped off out of Matthew's portfolio. So it came from Matthew's portfolio, went into Gleason's pictorial, and then um, I don't know whether Charles Farrar Brown got it from there. More likely, Matthew had shown a copy to him directly by way of mentoring. And instead of, as many of these young people did, instead of taking inspiration from Matthew's work and writing their own, they would either steal his work outright or they would rework something of his, see? So that's what Charles Farr Brown, the famous Charles Farr Brown did to get his start, was to rework something of Matthew's and insert it into the paper. Matthew apparently never told Schillerber that that was one of his. Now, there's something in the carpet bag called The Vulture. It's a parody, one of the best parodies of The Raven. It appears in the December 18, 1852 edition of The Carpet Bag. I don't have a copy. If I had a cool 13,000 lying around, I could get it right now. Um, and uh, it was reprinted in Cruikshank's Almanac for 1853 and the December 1853 edition of Graham's Magazine. Uh, people, uh, the scholars, never found it in the carpet bag. Apparently, I'm the one that discovered it in the carpet bag, and nobody will ever acknowledge it to me. But uh, if you look it up, you will find that uh, people attributed it either to John Sachs, if they find it in Graham's, or to Robert Brough, a British, B-R-O-U-G-H, I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, if they find it in Crookshank's Almanac. There's a whole bunch of depth to that question. I have both. Uh, originals of that. I won't get them out now, but I have not the one in the carpet bag, but I have both of the reprints in uh, Graham's and in Crookshank's. Now there's a fellow named Nathaniel Deering, who was a city patron here in Portland. Uh, he was a fan of Matthew's uh, Ethan Spike series set in Hornby, and he did at least one spin-off imitation of it, uh, respectfully. But uh, Matthew in the Constellation, in the New York Constellation back in 1831-32, signed D. I think that might have started out as a printer's devil, and then Matthew kept it as Diogenes. I'm not sure. That would be my guess. But anyway, he signed D in the Constellation. I can show that it was, I can prove that that was him and not Asa Green, the editor-in-chief. He brought back that signature, D, in the Portland transcript, uh, writing more or less about Ethan Spike and Hornby, and the biographer, 
for Nathaniel Deering assumed, because Nathaniel Deering had kept clippings of these things as a fan, that he had written them. They were not written by Nathaniel Deering. They were written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, bringing back an old pseudonym from the constellation. There's depth and context there we won't go into. Then there's Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber. They collaborated in the carpet bag. I can prove that. There's one story signed with Matthew's star or single asterisk that's about one of Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber's Mrs. Partington characters, her nephew Ike. It's about Ike, but it's signed with a star, so Shillaber let Matthew write one of his characters in the carpet bag. And there's a lot more collaborations between the two of them that nobody knows about. Uh, there are two books that uh, Shillaber published, compilations, one in, I believe, 1852, and, or let's see if I've got it written down. 1854, called The Life and Sayings of Mrs. Partington. There's Matthew's work in there. The um, biography, the fall biography of Mrs. Partington was not written by Shillaber. It was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier in that book. Then there's something called Partingtonian Patchwork, which was published in um, 1872, I believe. Here's a copy of Partingtonian Patchwork. I have two of them, I believe. And there's quite a bit of work of Matthews in here. There's one about a Dr. Spooner. It's an epic, uh, humorous poem, philosophical, humorous poem in verse. That's like Matthews' best humorous uh, epic poem. It's not Shillaber, it's Matthew Franklin Whittier, I'm sure of it, and it's exceptionally good. It's been completely ignored by scholars, so far as I can tell. Um, there's also a whole series about Blifkins the Martyr. Matthew was actually the first person to introduce that name and the carpet bag under K.K. Blifkins. That's a poem. It's definitely Matthew's by style. So Matthew initiated the name Blifkins. The uh, series about Blifkins the Martyr, this is an unfortunate, unfortunately married man. Um, and... As near as I can tell, this was a collaboration, but it was really stories that Matthew had told Shillaber about his unfortunate second arranged marriage, which uh, Shillaber fashioned into these stories. And occasionally Matthew's own writing, like a couple poems, are included in there. But uh, that poem about Dr. Spooner, In Search of the Delectable, is really the gem that's in here that nobody has discovered. I highly recommend you look it up. You can find it online. Take your time, read it, and get out of your head any preconceptions that Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, the creator of Mrs. Partington, was the author. It was not. It was Matthew Franklin Whittier, uh, who was a philosopher and, a, and a, uh, a brilliant, humorous poet who had started at age 12 in 1825 with sophisticated work. So... Uh, it's, it's a case where nobody recognizes quality because of the lack of uh, fame and credentials, okay? Uh, you have to recognize these things not by reputation. You have to recognize them directly, you know, and this is a case where this deserves to be recognized. Uh, that's Shillaber. There's more there, of course. There's a fellow named James W. Morris who used a pseudonym Jacques Maurice, and... Um, he published a compilation of Matthew's characters uh, called K.N. Pepper and his supposed discoverer, uh, P. Pepper Pod. Well, Matthew's nickname had been Peter Pumpkin. He was known as Some Pumpkins because he was a pepper. And uh, all of that was Matthew Franklin Whittier. It appears in the Knickerbocker from like 1854 to 1856. I've got all the volumes down here. I can pull out one, I guess, as an example. Some of these are in incredible condition. I guess I guess they were like never read or something. I don't know, stored away someplace. But um, the supposed story, backstory of all this, is that P. Pepper Pod has discovered a rustic genius poet named K.N. Pepper, which of course resolves phonetically to Cayenne Pepper, and uh, he's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a satire on the whole idea of discovering a, a rustic genius, see? But actually, it's a real genius writing them because the, the mind behind K.N. Pepper, the humor, is just absolutely brilliant. Well, apparently, he had a young fan 
this James W. Morris, who kind of convinced Matthew uh, reluctantly to accept the idea of a compilation. So in this, the K. The K. N. Pepper Papers by um, Jacques Maurice, we have alternating uh, this fellow Morris's uh, little essays with Matthew's K. N. Pepper material, see? Uh, and there's a couple originals in here that weren't uh, printed in the Knickerbocker. To me, now this could be that it's my own past life work and my higher mind works exactly the same as Matthew's does, includes sense of humor. These things are a scream, just absolutely a scream. Um, <laughs> I mean, they crack me up every single time I read them. Um, and there's philosophy in them too. Uh, one of them is about pushing too hard. It's called Eclipse uh, or Eclipse. So uh, it's exactly my own personality of pushing too hard and burning out. You know, and that Matthew had the same problem because he had the same higher mind and you know very similar personality. So there's a lot in there. It was, it was never attributed to Matthew Franklin Whittier. It even shows up a few years later in uh, Vanity Fair, there's one, which I have a copy of. But anyway, that's K.N. Pepper and P. Pepper Pod. That's all, Matthew. It's attributed now officially to James W. Morris, the whole thing. People completely missed Matthew in there. And the last one was a friend of Matthew's at the Boston Custom House named... Uh, Frank Harriman. Now there's a story behind that. I recognized Frank Harriman's name before I knew that they were close friends. Uh, I later in extrapolated that they were friends because there's a story that was clearly written by Matthew, which was published under Frank Harriman's name a year and a half after Matthew died. And the story talks about them going together to a particular place, going down into a, a cave, see? And uh, obviously they were friends and they'd gone to this place in Lynn, Massachusetts and they'd taken the tour and whatever. Uh, past life memory, first off, I recognize his picture, even though I know who it is, so it's not exactly evidential, but uh, very strong recognition for his profile. And um, I know I can definitely show that that was Matthew Franklin Whittier's story, that that Frank Harriman published under his own name. That actually shows up in two different volumes. Um, I have one of them here, the Granite Monthly. That story is in here. This is the uh, July and August 1884, number seven and eight, volume seven, if anybody wants to look it up. Um, now, why Harriman published that under his own name after, after Matthew died, I have no idea. I know I haven't gotten all of them, but there were a couple of instances where there's work that was written by Matthew or Abby, which is attributed to other people in the historical record, and I did want to touch on them. The first one has to do with um, a fellow named Charles Burdett, who was ostensibly an author in New York City, but I think he was really more of a publisher who uh, people wrote for. And uh, this was around 1845, 1846, when Matthew was also apparently ghostwriting for Francis Duravage, and he was in New York City writing uh, for the New York Tribune as the star, which material uh, historians think was written by Margaret Fuller. So it was all around the same time. Uh, Matthew apparently ghost wrote two little novels for this fellow, and... Um, one in 1845 and one in 1846. So one of them is called Never Too Late, and I have a copy of that. And I found that because I ran across a little Boston newspaper called The Sheet Anchor. And I had a past life flashback, sort of, just a strong sense of recognition for it. I, I just emotionally said, oh, I, you know, I remember that. I know that, I, you know, like on uh, Jurassic Park, you know, where Alex says, I know that, the Unix system. So this one has a little story, and it's called The Contrast. And I looked it up. Fortunately, on Google, you can, you can Google 
internal lines in poetry or prose, and I found that it came from this book. It was a chapter in this book called Never Too Late, ostensibly by Charles Burdett, and I let it go. I said, okay, well, you know, for like a year or two, I said, oh, I was disappointed, but I said, I can't argue with that. It says that he was a prolific Christian writer and so forth and so on. The sheet anchor, I think, was intended to uh, kind of proselytize to the sailors in Boston. So uh, I let it go, but at some point it just kept bothering me and I looked into it. And the more I looked into Charles Burdett, the more I realized that his style was all over the map, that just like uh, Pierre Shafton in England, he couldn't have written all these different things because some of them are very awkward and some of them are very well written and a couple of them are very much in Matthew's style. And I finally decided that Matthew had written these two. So it's Never Too Late, which was one chapter of which was reproduced as a story in the sheet anchor where I recognized it. And the other one, which I believe was 1846, is called Lilla Heart. I just recently got hold of this, did a little repair work on the spine. It's not in the best of shape, but it's much better than when I first got it because it was falling apart. So Lilla Heart, A Tale of New York, I think that's 1846, supposedly Charles Burdett. That's also Matthew Franklin Whittier. They're really nice little novels there. They read very much like uh, The Debtor's Prison that he published in 1834. It's uh, pretty much the same kind of style. and I think they're much better than the average. Again, he would take kind of uh, not the highest forms of literature, the most respected forms, and he would turn it into real literature, in my personal opinion. Now, the other one, which I've touched on before, is The Fables of La Fontaine. If you look that up, you will find that Elijah Wright, who became the editor of the Boston Chronotype, is credited with having translated into English The Fables of La Fontaine, the verses of La Fontaine, which were based in turn on Aesop's fables. I believe, and I have good reason to believe this, that Matthew and Abby were the original translators, that uh, Abby tutored Matthew, she was uh, raised French, so she was a native French speaker. She was tutoring him in lieu of him having a college education because she was a child prodigy and she was obtaining a private European-style tutored education at her home. And so even though she was four years younger, she was brilliant and she was tutoring him. And she gave him at least as good an education as he would have gotten in a college. And she also taught him metaphysics, which he resisted at first and later embraced. But um, what would happen is she apparently gave uh, Matthew uh, these fables as a homework assignment and to learn French. And so he would, because he was a, a really inspired, humorous poet, he was able to do an exceptionally good job on these. This is one of the earliest editions where the illustrations are actually taken from the French, according to Elijah Wright. And uh, being a French native speaker, she would correct them. So between the two of them, it was, a, it was a collaboration between the two, really. And one reason that I know it was them is that in 1840, 1839, Matthew and Abby, as I believe, published this. It's a kind of trial balloon, as they say. La Fontaine, a present for the young, as for kids. And if you look into it, basically what they've done is to alternate their favorites. So there'll be one of Abby's favorites and then one of Matthew's. And you can see the difference in their personality. Um, I don't think this one was ever read by anybody. Um, I don't think it went anywhere. But then Abby died in March of 1841. So what Matthew apparently did, Elijah Wright was his friend. He knew him through abolitionist circles, through his brother. Later he worked for him and wrote for him for the Boston Chronotype, and they became very good friends later on, by all accounts. Um, so what Matthew did, I think, after Abby died, was to take the entire manuscript that they were going to turn into a larger book and just hand it to him, and uh, kind of like what he did with Charles Dickens. And he said, look, just take these, keep our name out of it, and just do with it as you will, because he was just that much devastated. And I think he was giving away everything that reminded him of Abby in a fit of extreme stoicism because he was a stoic philosopher so he handed this over to Elijah Wright and Elijah Wright apparently didn't have any ethical problem with really going all out and pretending that he had translated them all because in his own preface in 1841 he goes to great lengths about how he was translating them for his son and so on but it's very implausible 
when you realize, first of all, how good they are, and Elijah Wright didn't ha really have a background in poetry, and certainly not in humorous poetry. Matthew had a tremendous background, see, very deep background in humorous poetry. He was exceptionally good in that area. Um, and, Ma and Abby, again, was a native French speaker, whereas Elijah Wright may have studied it in college. I don't know. He went to college. That's all we know about his French, see. So, it's much, much more plausible that Matthew and Abby together created those uh, as opposed to Elijah Wright doing all of them. He may have done like the last half, the second volume, or some portion thereof. Elijah Wright may have translated some, and they are kind of un of uneven quality. So some of them are really brilliant, in particular the ones that are in La Fontaine. There is one little piece of evidence, of objective evidence, and that is that in this volume, where Reynard the Fox shows up, uh, it's spelled here R-E-Y-N-A-R-D, R-E-Y-N-A-R-D, Reynard, um, which is probably a phonetic spelling. When Elijah Wright puts his book out, where Reynard the Fox shows up, he's spelled R-E-N-A-R-D without the Y. And twice, Matthew referred to this character in passing, and Matthew spelled it the same way it's spelled in this little book that I think he and Abby put out, R-E-Y-N-A-R-D. So there's a little objective clue that this was done by Matthew and Abby, and then when uh, Elijah Wright put his out, that, that he decided to spell it probably the technically correct way. You can tell that I'm somewhat compulsive about this. So uh, I've got a few things to correct here, including I finally corrected the lighting. But uh, there's a couple additions and, and one correction, actually. Where I had said that uh, Albert Pike, the ass, had published a lot of uh, his student Abbey Poyen's uh, poetry uh, as the Hymns to the God series, and he did so individually in the American Monthly Magazine of 1830, Willis's, N.P. Willis's magazine, that was correct. But when I said that he reprinted it, resubmitted it to Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine of 1836, that was incorrect. It should have been 1839. I have an original of that also. Uh, so uh, we've got him uh, caught red-handed between these two volumes. Um, also, with regard to uh, the future Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I forgot to mention with regard to the cry of the children, which was one of Matthew Franklin Whittier's poems, that uh, she had published it the year before in 1843 in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine. I have a copy of that. Um, now, here's a strange one. Um, in a, a book called Whittier's Poems, Whittier's Complete Poems, here it says Whittier's Illustrated Poems. This is by no means a first edition, uh, which I can't afford, but... Um, in it is a, a very popular poem called The Pumpkin. So very often if you get on any website or any presentation that has to do with Thanksgiving, they will quote John Greenleaf Whittier's poem, The Pumpkin. That was not written by John Greenleaf Whittier. That was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. And the backstory of that is that, as I mentioned, uh, Matthew was very close friends with Elijah Wright in Boston, the uh, editor of the Boston Chronotype. And John Greenleaf Whittier also was personal friends. They were all involved in the anti-slavery movement. Both brothers were personal friends with Elijah Wright. So apparently, uh, Elijah Wright had invited Matthew, possibly both brothers, to Thanksgiving dinner. See, and uh, Matthew, of course, his nickname was uh, Peter Pumpkin because as a boy, he loved pumpkin pies, obviously as an adult as well. And he must have loved the pie so much that, and praised it so highly that Mrs. Wright gave him one to take home. So as a result, he wrote a poem, a thank you poem. And that poem was published in the October 1st, 1846 edition of the Boston Chronotype, Elijah Wright's paper. It was called Song of the Pumpkin, and it was signed by a Yankee. John Greenleaf Whittier did not use pseudonyms. It's in Matthew Franklin Whittier's style. It's clearly Matthew's poem. How it ended up in Whittier's compilation, I don't think John Greenleaf Whittier stole it. It's possible Matthew said, go ahead and use it. Most likely what happened is that whoever 
compiled this compilation had heard by rumor that Whittier had written the poem, see? And maybe uh, Elijah Wright told one guy, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier's brother, Matthew, wrote it. And the next guy said Whittier wrote it. And the third guy says Whittier wrote it. And by the time it got into this compilation, um, which was 1848, uh, two years later, then they all thought John Greenleaf Whittier wrote it. And by the time it got in the poem, John Greenleaf Whittier didn't want to, you know, rock the boat. And Matthew didn't want to be known as the author. He liked to stay anonymous, so it was left the way it is. Uh, I do have, I don't have a copy of the, uh, of the poem in the chronotype. I do have uh, copies of the chronotype. There's one. This is the weekly chronotype. Uh, they would, of course, have dailies, and then every week they'd print a weekly with some of the best of. So uh, that's just an example of what it looked like. It has a train up in the um, masthead and so on. Now, um, this the last one here. This is called the Portland White Mountains and Montreal Railroad Guide, written uh, for, published in Portland and written in Portland. It's supposedly by S. B. Beckett. Well, S. B. Beckett was one of Matthew's acquaintances in the um, uh, Portland Spiritualist Association, and uh, there he was a writer. But again, we're talking context. This happens to be the printer's proof, so you can see the changes that were made and so on. Um, Matthew had traveled as quails, writing for the Boston Weekly Museum, for several years, from 1849 until 1852. In 1852, he started working for the post office in Portland, uh, I think probably to help raise his uh, third uh, child by the second arranged marriage. He'd split from this woman, Jane Vaughn, but he wanted to help raise his uh, daughter, uh, Allie. So he began living in Portland, and while he was there, he ghost wrote this railroad guide for S.B. Beckett. And this is just another instance where Matthew would take what you call a lowly level literary job, and he would turn it into real literature because he really couldn't do anything else. So it's gorgeously written. It's beautifully written, and of course, nobody pays any attention to its literary quality, but this was also written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. So that just gives you some idea of the way that Matthew's extensive legacy is floating around out there. Um, and, and the analogy I would use is there's a fellow, I won't, I won't name him, um, but he used to be a saxophonist for a major jazz band and then he split off from the band. And when I go to the grocery store, he has a distinctive sound and I could be wrong, but in the music that they play in the grocery store, the canned music, I could swear I hear his solos in there, you know? And I don't know for sure, but this is the way Matthew was. He ghost wrote for other people, he remained anonymous, people appropriated his work either with his permission or otherwise, uh, and all of his legacy is just floating around out there under a whole bunch of other names. What it means is in the 19th century, there were not as many good authors as you think there were. You know, I mean, this probably happened with other people as well. But when you get to this level of inspiration, inspired work, there are really only a handful out there. And it got kind of scattered amongst all these other people. So uh, um, I have put it back together and so far nobody's shown any particular interest, but I think someday when I'm taken seriously, this will be of interest.